Because of their rotating components, all compressors require a lubrication. Early designs of reciprocating compressors utilized a splash system in which the throw on the crankshaft would dip into an oil pool in the crankcase and splash it over the moving parts as the shaft rotated. Today, reciprocating compressors used in industrial refrigeration utilize internal force feed lubrication in which oil is forced through machined passages in the compressor to lubricate specific components, such as bearings, connecting rods, cylinder walls, and piston pins. Since the oil passages are small, reciprocating compressors require an oil pump that is typically driven by the compressor shaft. So my artwork's not good enough to draw a cutaway of a reciprocating compressor. So I grabbed this off the internet. This is a cutaway of a Vilter reciprocating compressor, just a generic cutaway, but it's really helpful to see how oil uh, is ported through a reciprocating compressor. Now, a given manufacturer and model of compressor might be a little different, but this will give you the big idea of how an internal force feed lubrication system works in a recip. Um, so anything orange here is kind of representing oil. And at the bottom here of our crankcase, we have our reservoir, our reservoir of oil. Um, and there'd be a sight glass that you could look in here and see that level at, at approximately halfway. Um, in order to move the oil through the compressor to all the spots that need lubrication, there will be an oil pump. And that oil pump is driven by the crankshaft, which is connected to the motor, which we can't see on this, on this drawing. Okay, the oil is pulled through this darker orange color here is the strainer and it's pulled through this port here that's machined into the housing, um, into the pump where then it's uh, pumped all throughout this compressor. We're going to go over that. I want to point out, um, you see this little gray here, that's a, just a plug. So in the machining process, right, they machine this through the housing, they put these plugs in, obviously so oil doesn't just spill out onto the ground, but it also provides a, an access point if it's ever needed. So from the pump, it's pumping oil into the the external oil filters. So this is what's clean the oil particulates, mostly metal that might um, that might you know come off in small pieces in the in the pistons or whatever. Um, so that's getting filtered out, and the oil is getting um, placed. Um, you know, one, one key area here that's indicated here and here is into the bearings. So the bearings, which are providing the um, uh, support of that crankshaft, making sure it spins freely, need to be lubricated and the oil is ported there. Um, here you can see it going through what looks like a valve or something and kind of just open the space. If this is an ammonia recip, there's going to be an external oil cooler because of um, the high discharge temperature. You got to cool that, cool that oil down so that's not displayed but the oil would, uh, would leave here to an external oil cooler, probably cooled by water, um, and enter back probably here um, into this um, seal housing cavity. You notice this is a, kind of like a big area of orange. So that whole cavity is really critical. It's filled with oil because there's a lot of points that need lubrication. Um, so from here, again, we're, we're lubricating the bearings on this side, but it's also getting um, um, able to enter into the crankshaft because there's holes actually drilled through the crankshaft. So it's channeled through the crankshaft. You can see it going here, here. You could even see little holes in the in the crankshaft. And these holes are where that oil can then escape. Some of that oil will drop back to the, the reservoir, the crankcase, but others gets onto uh, the connecting rod. Um, and you can see on this rod, you can see the oil is, is even ported through the connecting rod all the way up to the wrist pin. And so all through that process, we're getting the oil to the key spots where lubrication is required. Any oil that, you know, falls out or whatever just can collects back into the crankcase where it just gets uh, pumped back through the system again. So that's a, a big overview of how an internal force feed lubrication system works. A term to be familiar with is net oil pressure. Net oil pressure is the difference between the pressure at the outlet of the oil pump and the suction pressure. Since the crankcase is at suction pressure, the net oil pressure must be higher than the suction pressure to move oil through the narrow passages. Typically, reciprocating compressors require a net oil pressure between 25 and 40 psi. To learn how to calculate net oil pressure, it's really not that hard. The math is very straightforward. Uh, the, the, really the only challenge is identifying which pressures we need to uh, observe and record in order to determine what our net oil pressure is. So on the whiteboard here, I've drawn uh, kind of just a simple six cylinder reciprocating compressor and I've shown three gauges uh, intended to be the suction, pressure gauge, 
a discharge pressure gauge and an oil pressure gauge that's connected to the, the crankcase. Net oil pressure is the difference between the uh, oil pressure and the suction pressure. Because the oil gets supplied back to the suction side of the compressor, that's why that is the net oil pressure. It's the difference between these two. So the main takeaway you have to keep in mind when solving a problem for net oil pressure, if you're given the discharge pressure, you don't really need to use that. In fact, you don't need to use that. So net oil pressure in this example is simply gonna be 50 minus 10, which equals 40. And of course our units are still PSI. The net oil pressure in this example is 40 PSI. All reciprocating compressors are equipped with a crankcase oil heater, which is designed to automatically activate when the compressor is off. The oil heater ensures that the oil temperature is suitably warm and prevents refrigerant vapor from condensing in the compressor. Additionally, reciprocating compressors are typically configured with an oil separator downstream of the compressor. The oil separator is a small vessel that is designed to separate oil droplets from the refrigerant and return the oil back to the compressor crankcase. Due to the importance of lubricating oil, reciprocating compressors are often equipped with a low oil pressure cutout switch. The oil pressure cutout switch is typically arranged to detect pressure differential across the oil pump and will shut the compressor off if low pressure is detected for 90 seconds. Screw compressors require significantly more oil than reciprocating compressors. In addition to lubrication, oils serve several valuable functions in a screw compressor. First, the oil is effective at removing heat from the bearings and other moving parts. Second, the oil seals tight surfaces such as between piston rings in reciprocating compressors and around rotors in screw compressors. Third, the oil helps reduce the sound intensity or noise generated by a compressor. Fourth, the oil cleans the compressor by removing small metal particles that are removed in the oil filter. Finally, oil is used to activate the slide valve in screw compressors. Because the oil absorbs a significant amount of the heat of compression, the temperature of the oil tends to increase when a compressor is running. For this reason, screw compressors are designed with an oil cooling system. There are three primary types of screw compressor oil cooling systems. Direct liquid injection is a widely used oil cooling method for screw compressors. This method is employed by injecting a small amount of liquid refrigerant from the high pressure receiver into the screw at an early stage of compression. Prior to injection, the high pressure liquid passes through an expansion valve to lower the temperature of the liquid. Historically, a thermostatic expansion valve, or TXV, was the control valve of choice, but in recent years, motorized expansion valves have been employed with excellent results. The downside of liquid injection oil cooling is that it reduces the overall capacity of the compressor since some of its volume is taken up by liquid. Additionally, liquid is generally incompressible, so the direct injection of liquid into the screw moderately increases the wear and tear on the compressor. Liquid injection is attractive because it is the least expensive to implement and does not require any special heat exchangers for heat removal. Thermosiphon oil cooling is accomplished by supplying saturated liquid ammonia at the condensing pressure to an external heat exchanger mounted adjacent to the screw compressor. Typically, the liquid is supplied from a dedicated vessel called a thermosiphon vessel or receiver. The heat exchanger has two circuits. The first circuit receives hot lubricating oil from the screw compressor. This oil is cooled by the warm ammonia supplied from the thermosiphon vessel. As the oil transfers heat into the liquid ammonia, vapor is formed, which is returned to the thermosiphon vessel. Reduced temperature oil exits the heat exchanger and is returned to the screw compressor. Thermosiphon oil cooling does not impose the same penalties on the system as liquid injection oil cooling. It therefore is known as being a more efficient means of oil cooling. The first cost of employing thermosiphon oil cooling, however, can be high because of the extra system components that are required. Water oil cooling is most similar to thermosiphon oil cooling in that each screw compressor will have a dedicated heat exchanger for oil cooling. Water-cooled compressors, however, will utilize water as the cooling medium instead of ammonia. As the water absorbs heat from the oil, 
its temperature will rise. As a result, water cooling systems require a cooling tower to reject the heat absorbed in the water to the atmosphere. Sometimes a dedicated portion of the condenser is utilized for this purpose. On the whiteboard here, I've got a lot going on. I want to walk through the three major types of oil cooling systems that we see for screw compressors. All right, let's start with liquid injection oil cooling. Uh, this is probably the simplest and, and, and a very commonly employed method. Um, in liquid injection oil cooling, we have a compressor which discharge, which receives suction vapor, compresses it, discharges into an oil separator. <clears throat> the oil separator um, uh, vapor leaves the oil separator, goes to a condenser, just like a traditional system, and then drains into a receiver. We take a branch from that receiver and we take it back to the compressor through an expansion device. Um, historically, it's usually been a thermostatic expansion valve or a TXV, which lowers the temperature and pressure of the refrigerant. It's, very, it's usually a very small line, half inch, so that a small amount of cold liquid ammonia then gets injected into precise locations in the screw, which lowers the temperature of the discharge vapor and oil. Okay, and that's how the oil cooling is accomplished. We don't have any extra heat exchangers. Uh, there's a pump under here, but this pump is not involved in the cooling method. The oil pump that I've depicted is simply pulling from the separator and pumping oil through a filter back to the compressor for so it can lubricate, all right? Um, so that's liquid injection cooling. The benefit of liquid injection cooling is a simple method. A uh, downside of it though, as we've learned many times, is that compressors do not like liquid. So how do we use a liquid to cool a compressor? Well, the answer is we use a very, very small amount and screw compressors can tolerate that. However, over time, it does contribute to a, a faster wear and tear on the compressors. Uh, modern compressors, however, have made this an even better method by getting rid of the thermostatic expansion valve and utilizing a motorized expansion valve, which can very precisely meter the flow into the screw to minimize that wear and tear. So we're just precisely putting the right amount of liquid into the screw to cool it. All right, moving on to our second method, which is thermosiphon oil cooling. Okay, thermosiphon oil cooling um, has kind of been used quite quite extensively over time because it's kind of known as a more efficient means of oil cooling. In a thermosiphon oil cooling system, we add a new vessel in between the condenser and the receiver, which we call a thermosiphon vessel. Sometimes it's called a thermosiphon receiver, okay? Um, liquid drains into this vessel first before the receiver, and then it overflows into the receiver. And then we take a line um, off the bottom of the thermosiphon vessel, this is called thermosiphon supply, and take it to a heat exchanger. And that heat exchanger is mounted adjacent to the screw compressor and has a uh, warm ammonia liquid on one side and hot compressor oil on the other. So we're using this warm ammonia liquid to cool the hot compressor oil, all right? And in that process, the liquid, um, some of it will vaporize and be returned to the thermosiphon vessel. I didn't draw, but there's actually an equalizer. I'll, I'll go ahead and put it on there. There's actually an equalizer pipe that connects from uh, here to here so that any vapor between the thermosiphon vessel and receiver can flow freely. So this method is better than liquid injection in that we're not putting any liquid into the screw. In fact, we're just cooling the oil independently over here so we have cooler oil being supplied to the compressor. And that's an advantage. It operates more efficiently um, and less wear and tear in the compressor. However, there is a downside to this and that is cost. We have to install this, we have to purchase this vessel, then we have to install this vessel. We have all the extra piping, the extra heat exchanger, and bear in mind, this will be on every one of the compressors in, in the system that utilizes this form of oil cooling. The final method of oil cooling that I want to discuss is, is called water cooling. And this method is very similar to thermosiphon, actually. We will have a heat exchanger that's mounted adjacent to the compressor, just like in thermosiphon oil cooling. In fact, if you were to just go and look at the heat exchanger for this one versus this one, they'll look pretty much the same um, in either instance. However, now we no longer have the thermosiphon vessel. We don't have the piping associated with it. In fact, we're back to a simple, in fact, probably the simplest looking system 
in that we just have our traditional system, suction going in, discharge entering the oil separator, into the condenser, draining to the receiver, nothing's getting returned back to the compressor. So how's the oil cooling accomplished? Well, we use a heat exchanger, but instead of using ammonia as the cooling agent, we use water, okay? So water's um, plentiful, we can find it pretty easily, it's easy to work with. Um, so in order to use water, as the cooling agent though, we will need a cooling tower or in many instances, um, the system condenser will be designed with an independent circuit for this purpose. So this water will have its own pump that cycles it through the condenser or a cooling tower so that it doesn't just heat up over time. And then this cools the oil circuit which then could be supplied back to the compressor. So that's a brief overview of the three major methods for uh, oil cooling of screw compressors.